thank you very much. And uh, thanks, thank you all for being here at this hour of the evening, <laughs> after uh, after a very long day, <laughs> after this wonderful meal, which makes me feel that uh, anything I'm gonna say right now, I'm gonna get away with, you know. So because, <laughs> so this is kind of of a relief, you know. <laughs> Whatever I'm gonna say is is gonna be fine with you. I'm gonna talk about the topic that we've been talking about. Uh, uh, one session after the other, the New Egypt challenges and achievements. And because I knew that I was going to give this after 9 p.m., I thought it would be safer that I, that I write down what I was going to say, so to, just to read it, you know, hopefully not to fall asleep in the middle of the, of the speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me first to express my deepest appreciation and gratitude for being invited to address this distinguished gathering. It is indeed an honor and a privilege for me to give this keynote speech. I am also much honored to be talking from this platform, the historic Apollo, uh, Apollo Hall. And uh, I'm keen to be talking uh, 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 and then seize this opportunity to provide you with a real image, from my perspective of course, about the challenges Egypt is facing what we have achieved thus far, as well as our aims and objectives in order to fulfill the aspirations of the Egyptian people in freedom, stability, and prosperity. I'm also eager to convey Egypt's new vision towards its relations with the international community after the Egyptian revolution. Uh, as you may allow, uh, as you allow me to, to say that Egypt, as well as other Arab Spring countries resided under autocracy for many decades. Unfortunately, when democracy and freedom were spreading in many countries across the globe, especially in Eastern Europe, after the end of the Cold War, uh, authoritarianism was, I know how it is written, but I don't know how to pronounce it, so <laughs> being authoritative, it means, was consolidating itself in many other spots, including some Arab countries. The Egyptian, Yemeni, Libyan, Tunisian, and Syrian regimes were investing heavily in their security apparatus to avoid any snowballing democratization that may be incited by this marvelous and sweeping wave of change. These, uh, uh, these regimes missed many golden opportunities to initiate extensive political and economic reforms and made the wrong choice to strengthen their grip on power through systematic exclusion and repression. Uh, since the toppling of the oppressive regime in Egypt, as well as in other, others, other Arab Spring countries, we were conscious that the way forward will not be smooth, but we believed that the clock can never be set back, and that the positive energy unleashed by the people who arose independently in Tahrir Square and throughout the Arab world has the capability of turning the challenges we face into opportunities, the fears that grip us into hope. Uh, unlike, many, unlike many believe, uh, unlike many believe, Egyptians are not passive and do not tolerate injustice and oppression. This might be the case for brief moments in Egypt's history. But this is not the trend. For those who do not buy what I'm saying, uh, please tell me where else in the world do you find the people that have undertaken five major revolutions within the last 200 years? We've, we've gone through a revolution uh, early 19th century during uh, Muhammad Ali's time against uh, the, uh, the French campaign, then the Arabi Revolution, 1919 Revolution, 1952 Revolutions, and 2011, finally, 2011 Revolutions. Revolution. Uh, such people could definitely lead a sixth and a seventh one if someone took them back to an autocratic path. So if we, if, we, if we start talking about the challenges to the democratic transition, uh, and I'm going to concentrate on Egypt, of course, 
The first challenge, challenge that uh, we had to tackle delicately and with maximum sensitivity is the role of the military, the topic we just talked about uh, a couple of hours back. We have seen two different models of the military intervening in politics during the Arab revolutions. The first in Egypt and Tunisia, and the second in Libya, Yemen, and Syria. The presence of the army in the political life during the early phases of transition was a fact and necessity. Both Egypt and Tunisia were able to manage efficiently this situation and restore the civilian order thanks to the professionalism and awareness of the military institutions in both countries. On the other hand, we witnessed devastating results on how regime can use its army against his own people in Libya and Syria. Putting the foundations for a clear, sustainable, professional civil military relations is an issue that we have to address thoroughly to consolidate the civilian aspect of the state. Yet, it may take uh, some time for this framework to mature and develop. But I still believe, as I, as I just said a couple of hours back, that, that we achieved a very good progress in this regard, and we will have to go through the rest of the transition, hopefully very smoothly. The second set of challenges related to the problems uh, uh, inherited from the previous regimes, especially the rampant corruption and the violation of human rights. Such a situation, unfortunately, affected all the structures of our institutions. The institutional decay that spread widely, if not handled and dealt with swiftly, may jeopardize the whole transition process and causes regression. That is why the most urgent task of the newly elected leadership is to rebuild democratic institutions to act in a more transparent and accountable manner so that we can achieve the good governance that we are aspiring to. This is a, a priority for us. <clears throat> the third set of challenges uh, uh, comes from the fact that the Egyptian revolution, as any other revolution, has its enemies. Counter-revolutionary forces and remnants of the previous regime penetrating throughout the states, constituting what we term as the deep state. We borrowed that term from our Turkish friends as well as other external actors are fueling unrest and uh, to destabilize the country and derail the democratic process by using illicit money used to finance illegal violent activities. In the same context, we are facing a serious challenge by some irresponsible media outlets, adopting in our views subjective rather than objective positions this does not mean that the administration is above criticism. On the contrary, criticism is, and differences in opinion are, definitely acceptable as long as they are substantiated. Unfortunately, some outlets misuse the value of freedom, which the administration upholds and act against all norms, ethics, and codes of conduct in a way that does not even occur in any democratic country and without being held accountable for their black propaganda. What is more surprising and even disappointing is that some of the media have provided cover for provoking violence, inciting hatred, and avoided condemn condemning violence explicitly. <clears throat> Despite the complexity of challenges, we are determined not to allow anyone to derail our democratic quest. The Egyptian people, youth, old, young, men and women, paid a huge price for their freedom and dignity and will never accept under any circumstances whatsoever to abandon what they believed in and achieved thus far. The message of firm commitment that I'm transmitting to you today comes from our conviction that the will of the people eventually reigns as it did in all democratic and developed countries like your country, like the United States. Achievements of the Egyptian revolution. This is the second point I'm going to address. In order to make our democracy work and to overcome the sets of challenges that I have elaborated, Egypt has embarked on a serious, on a serious effort to rebuild democratic institutions on a solid basis. Egypt went through five major electoral exercises since the revolution. 
that is two constitutional referenda, two parliamentary elections, and one presidential election. Uh, I can talk about three main landmarks achievements of these exercises. Uh, first, Egypt successfully elected for the first time ever in its history a civilian president after decades of military control. I wouldn't say military for, for General Sameh, not military rule, but military control. That's probably a, a more accurate uh, term. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a main a cornerstone in building the modern civil state that the Egyptians and the world aspire for. Second, to establish our new institutions on a solid ground, a tremendous effort was undertaken by an inclusive constituent assembly to draft the constitution despite other claims. We are aware that some concerns emerged about the formation of the constituent assembly, but the fact, that, but the fact remains that all withdrawals from the assembly, which came out to be 20 out of 100 members, took place only a few days before the adoption of the draft and were indeed motivated, in my opinion, as an eyewitness by reasons not mostly related to the articles of the Constitution, for except very few exceptions. Uh, such a crucial, crucial step was fundamental in order to define the rules of setting, uh, settling differences and to put the basis of the political system in a way that responds to the needs and demands of the Egyptian people and to accomplish the values of the Egyptian revolution, liberty, dignity, and justice. Uh, it is worth noting that the disputed articles in the Constitution, that some estimate to be 10, some say 15, some say 20, but that is out of 236 articles, are not related to how the state is run or how the checks and balances are defined. This is very important for minimizing the time of the transitional period, which is crucial for the country to move forward. Mechanisms to discuss and even change disputed articles are well defined by the new constitution. Once the House of Representatives is elected and functioning, uh, Freedom and Justice Party will not close the door for serious discussions to amend the document and hopefully achieve a wider consensus. Uh, nonetheless, it is important to emphasize that this Egyptian constitution was the most progressive constitution in Egyptian constitutional history, especially in the field of rights and freedoms. This is important to explain because of the misconceptions that have extensively been proponed on how bad this constitution document is. And uh, the most significant among the, accomplish the accomplishments of this constitution can be summarized as follows. When it comes to freedoms, for example, freedom of religion and belief, which is a valuable right that the state shall protect. The Constitution prohibits the denigration of religious messengers and prophets, guaranteeing freedom of expression by affirming freedom of the press and the ban of censorship on media. Freedom of association by allowing citizens to establish political parties and NGOs only by notice, as well as the right to organize peaceful demonstrations. When it comes to the rights, the Constitution preserved and uh, promoted rights in many articles. Women's rights, for example, and empowerment, empowering women is also a pillar of the Constitution. The new Constitution guarantees equal opportunity for all male and female citizens without discrimination. State-sponsored child care services, as well as constitutionally enshrining the rights of women who are divorced, widowed, or single breadwinners. The issue of political participation of women after the revolution is considered of great importance. Female candidates and female electorate, uh, electorate increased considerably after the revolution. We know that there are concerns regarding some criminal acts of violence and harassment against women. This harmful practice is totally prohibited and cannot be justified or tolerated by any means. Uh, and I'm sure that the cabinet is now working on a draft law for combating harassment and violence against women, but we believe that the law is not the only solution. The root causes of this problem have to be addressed uh, squarely. 
A second aspect of rights in, uh, enshrined in the Constitution is the citizenship principle. All citizens are equal and have same rights and responsibilities. All Egyptians living in disadvantaged areas within the Egyptian territory, as well as those who have different beliefs, are Egyptian citizens with equal opportunities and with no discrimination based on gender or belief. The third acquisition in terms of promoting rights is the prohibition of exceptional trials and civilian trials before military courts. Prohibition of any law which restricts core rights and freedoms, affirming the right of access to information, as well as stressing the human dignity. Uh, the third uh, achievement is the adoption of the Constitution in a free and, and, and fair referendum by two-thirds majority, and thus Egypt made a huge progress in its democratic quest. Yet, the completion of the transition will not happen until the elections of the new Egyptian House of Representatives uh, are held. Uh, the Freedom and Justice Party is firmly supportive to making the upcoming elections, whenever it is held, a success story by providing all the necessary guarantees of transparency and fairness under full judicial supervision and with the presence of international observers. Uh, now we can state that the democratic transition is about to be completed, hopefully soon, but our aspirations for the new Egypt go far beyond the structures. It is the operational aspects of the ideals upon which structures are built that merit our careful, careful nurturing. If we move to our aims and aspirations, I would like to address three main issues, uh, economy, culture, and foreign policy. In this connection, it is assumed that a major cornerstone of the new setup will have to be the amendment and fixation of the economic situation and rendering the economy to be more inclusive, thus improving the livelihood for all Egyptians. The key is to achieve higher growth, uh, growth that creates more jobs, and growth that is shared more equitably amongst all strands of society. This will bring me back to what I stressed earlier, that economic growth cannot be sustained without a free and inclusive political environment. Also economic development, while it is an essential factor for stability, it cannot, in my opinion, substitute the lack of freedoms. As you may know, the Egyptian economy is facing financial deficit, which requires influx of funds from abroad as the circulation of money internally would not suffice. Yet, fundamentals of the economy are solid. It is a well-diversified economy. The informal economy is broad and diverse, and we have a very large youth population, which makes our human resources the most solid basis for development in times of a knowledge-based economy. Globally, there is a condition of, of liquidity excess meaning that the money is looking for investment opportunities, and Egypt has a very high potential in that regard, and it's our job to provide the environment to attract these investments, hopefully soon. It is for this reason that I invite all the esteemed participants to convey the proper message about Egypt and its commitment to democracy and freedoms. I cannot disregard in my speech uh, one paramount Egyptian asset that we aim to promote, and that is culture. Our Undeniable soft power has always played a crucial role in transmitting our values to the region and to the world. We are counting on this channel and investing in it to transmit our new vision based on the values that emerged after the revolution. We are striving through our model to achieve better understanding among cultures and civilizations and to bridge any gap that exists due to stereotypes. However, we clearly believe that during our quest to find and wind in common grounds, we shall also respect the culture peculiarities of our societies. In this culture context, I need to raise one specific issue that clearly emerged from the Arab Spring, which is the role of the so-called political Islam. This new dimension that was included in the political equation proved its weight and consolidated its position within the transitional political spectrum and created a new momentum for the political dynamics. We believe that this new dimension 
is enrichment to the political life. And we are committed to prove the ability, not only of the coexistence, but also to cooperate constructively with other political actors. Exercising politics is not new to political Islam, especially in Egypt. However, exercising leadership is indeed new, and that is why we are open to engage all possible stakeholders in this vital political process. Political Islam has been systematically excluded and demonized, and thus we will not commit this sin with anybody else. Now the question that imposes itself is about the contribution that the values of Islam can bring to humanity. Our task to promote a new paradigm is not an easy one, especially with the existence of some negative prejudices. The religious component of all civilizations represents indeed a safety net for our shared human values within the broader context of diversity. This means that one specific set of cultural values cannot be imposed, but it should rather interact and engage with other cultures to ensure global harmony. What we propose is a new model based on the ideas, beliefs, and values entrenched in our norms and traditions. This model is comprehensive enough to provide sufficient responses to global issues related to development, combating injustice, tyranny and aggression, giving human dimension to the globalization, international civil society, combating violence, international justice, and human rights. We firmly believe that is, it is only by a genuine, responsible, and objective attitude that we can contribute together in exploring new avenues of cooperation. We trust that the great system of values that built, uh, that are, are built and consolidated the democracy in, 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 in your country shall serve as a bridge of understanding and mutual respect. Can we work together to achieve our mutual interests and uh, prosperity? Certainly. Can we succeed? Definitely. Now I'm going to shift to Egypt's new foreign policy. And uh, since the new administration assumed its duties on July 1st, 2012, a new Egypt Egyptian foreign policy has emerged based on a solid knowledge and facts about the Egyptian national interests. This new vision has been formulated since the established, has been under formulation since the establishment of the Freedom and Justice Party back in June 2011. It has been under continuous development since then, and it has started to extensively see the light under the Second Egyptian Republic. Egypt's envisaged new foreign policy is balanced, robust, and capable of fulfilling the aspirations of the Egyptian people. It is a comprehensive policy that identifies challenges and interests of Egypt and is flexible enough to formulate creative responsive, uh, responses in order to reach viable solutions while preserving national, regional, regional, and international security and stability. More important, the core characteristics of this policy are the enriched values of justice, dignity, and freedom inspire, inspired by the glorious Egyptian revolution. It is with these values, uh, with this values-based approach that we seek to contribute constructively to human development and world prosperity. We aim at reaching a new positioning for Egypt within the region and the world. The new, the new foreign policy is also multi-layered. It does not limit its actions to its geographical proximity, but it goes beyond that in order to strengthen relations with all responsible actors of the international community. In addition, Egypt is eager to play a proactive role within the regional and international forums and help formulate more coherent policies related to trade, environment, global warming, in, in, in infectious disease, transitional organized crimes, non-proliferation, as well as other fields of mutual interest. However, due to Egypt's geographical location and cultural affiliation, it is com uh, comprehensible that the issues related to the Middle East are highly positioned on our uh, foreign policy agenda. The past few months witnessed dramatic and accelerating developments in the Middle East region, especially 
with the turmoil in uh, the Palestinian territories and, this, and Syria, as well as uh, uh, the near geographical vicinity in the African Sahel region. Such developments still remain a source of threat to peace, security, and stability, and represent fertile ground for future destabilization. As you may all know, our new foreign policy has been tested at a very early stage during the aggression against Palestinians in Gaza. And I can say with satisfaction and confidence that it succeeded to establish itself and is currently gathering more momentum. Uh, Egypt, as a responsible stakeholder in the region and the international community, has been engaged in these crises since their emergence. We have been active in conducting consultations and coordinating efforts with concerned parties and other members of the international community. Egypt's role went further beyond cons consultations to launch specific initiatives aiming at resolving these crises and restoring stability to the region. These efforts bore fruit with the truce agreement in Palestine, and we expect further positive agreements in the near future. In short, I can summarize the objectives of the Egyptian foreign policy in the coming two years as developed by the Freedom and Justice Party as follows. Actually, four main objectives. The first one is the support of domestic growth and help getting, help getting Egypt out of the financial crisis. This is number one objective. Number two, preservation of Egyptian national security. Number three, achievement of balance, independence, and political impacts in foreign relations. And the fourth objective is the presentation of our civilization project as an international reference through which leadership can be achieved. I have much more I wish to say regarding the Egyptian foreign policy, especially the Middle East peace process, Syria and Iran. However, due to time limitation, I'll be happy to elaborate more on these topics through discussions, if any, and uh, uh, during the, the rest of the events uh, for tomorrow and, and the day after. And thank you very much for your kind attention.